Medical Director, MS Center of Miami, and Chairman of Neurology at FIU Medicine, we have and we welcome Dr. Jeffrey Horsmeyer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Stuart, and thanks so much for putting these uh, things together. They're, I think, very, uh, very well received. So I've been asked to talk about two things. One is the MRI and then a little bit about symptom management as well. All right, so we'll start with the MRI and... Uh, Okay, clinical utilization of MRI. And uh, MRIs are really very important, not only in the diagnosis, but the management of multiple sclerosis. Uh, it's one of, the, one of the best, what we call surrogate markers that we have in terms of uh, evaluating somebody to see if they have M uh, multiple sclerosis and to identify those who are progressing in the disease. Uh, and there are a number of different uh, types of lesions that we see on an MRI. There's uh, what we call white matter plaques. Well, let me start with the GAD enhancing lesions. GAD enhancing lesions. And those, that's the very first thing that shows up when, when there's an MS attack. So normally the seal between the blood vessel and between the brain is watertight. I mean, it's a super tight seal. Even water molecules can't pass back and forth. But the very first thing that happens with an MS attack is that that barrier between the artery uh, or between the veins and the brain becomes porous. <clears throat> so when you go for an MRI and they inject the gadolinium into your vein, as that gadolinium passes through that area where the, where the vein has become porous, it leaks out. And in that area where it leaks out into the brain, it changes the signal on the MRI. So we see what's called an enhancing lesion. And that's the very first thing that happens that shows up on an MRI in an acute, uh, in a, in an acute exacerbation. The next thing is T2 lesions. So it's, that's when you put the, on the flare or T2 sequences. I'll show you a couple in a minute. It's when, when, when your doctor has probably shown you an MRI and you see these little white spots. Well, those white spots are the, are the plaques or the, or the uh, T2 lesions. And those are, gen they can go away, but generally when they occur, they stay. They may evolve into what's called a black hole, but typically for years, those, once those plaques show up, uh, the plaques remain, and it's sort of a footprint as to how much has been happening over the past years. It's sort of the, the history of what's been happening with the, the MS in that particular patient. And uh, uh, then the black holes, that, that's, that's uh, what really contributes to the brain atrophy that we see sometimes uh, with MS. And what happens is the, the area of inflammation in that, in that plaque area has been so severe that it actually dissolves a little bit of brain tissue in that area. And so on, on the MRI, it's what we see what, a, a hole. It's called a black hole because it's best seen on those sequences where water is black. Because it really just when the brain dissolves and it's replaced by water. You know, na nature abhors a vacuum. So something has to, has to go in there. And uh, so brain atrophy is related to the black holes, but it, but it also uh, happens... Uh, in other ways other than just the black holes. And it's another measure of, of how much uh, um, you know, uh, injury there has been uh, to the brain from the MS. So um, you know, one of the things that, that the uh, treatments affect the best are MRI changes. I mean, out of all the drug trials that have been done, uh, it really the thing that responds, out of all the things we can measure in an MS patient, the thing that responds the very best to treatments is MRI activity. And so all of the treatments generally show a very dramatic decrease in the development of new enhancing lesions and uh, new T2 lesions. Uh, and so it's a very good surrogate marker. It's interesting though, and this is one of the mysteries of MS, it doesn't necessarily correlate with disability. There's a loose correlation, but there's not an exact correlation. And so there, there are people who have a lot of uh, lesions that don't have a lot of disease, and there are people who have more severe symptoms who don't have a lot of lesions. So it's just a sort of surrogate marker, uh, an estimate uh, that's useful, but it's not exact. So this is a, an example of a gadolinium enhancing lesion that uh, you can see right here. And this is what's called a T1-weighted lesion uh, or a sequence because you can see water is black here. And this is where that gadolinium has leaked out into the brain. In that area where there's inflammation, the veins became leaky, and when they injected the gadolinium, it leaked out into that area. And it, you can see it didn't leak out into the, any of the other areas, only in this area. And that's why it lit up. It changed, it changed the, uh, the signal that one gets when one turns on the magnet and, and turns off the magnet. 
And uh, so, you know, number of, as it says here on the slide, number of new gadolinium enhancing lesions is, is a very strong predictor of future disease activity. So if you see somebody shows up with a new diagnosis of MS or even with an exacerbation, and you see a lot of T2, a lot of gadolinium enhancing lesions, you really want to think hard about taking, uh, you know, strong action because it means there's a lot of uh, disease activity going on. Uh, this, these are T2-weighted lesions, uh, and it's, again, uh, this one shows up as well. This is a, an, a plaque here, but you can see some, this isn't a very good example of it, but there's a, some smaller plaques around here in some other areas as well. Um, and so we, we, when, when we do an MRI, we, from year to year, we compare. We try to go back and look at the old one, look at the new one, and what we want to know besides the enhancing lesions, are there more white matter lesions, number one, or have the previous white matter lesions increased in size? Both are markers that there's been disease progression. And so that's, on, our, on the new on the machine I was, uh, we're going to text you about later, uh, we, it has new technology where we can actually line up the head uh, year to year in exactly the same position. It has the way of, of adjusting the machine so that we, we get equivalent slices year to year, which will make, you know, make it a lot more accurate in, sort of in terms of you know, determining whether there's really been disease progression or not. This is a black hole right here. You can see water equivalent and it's uh, water density. And, uh, uh, and that's, that's sort of the end stage of the lesion. Uh, these, this is a much better shot of these are these uh, plaques that we uh, mentioned before. This is a flare sequence. You can see all these little white matter lesions. Particularly, they're more common around the ventricles, uh, but they occur everywhere in the brain. And, and actually, they, quite a bit of it occurs in the gray matter. It's just that the current MR technology uh, cannot pick up the plaques that's in the gray matter. Um, one of the things we're going to put on our machine is a, uh, what's called double inversion recovery, which will allow us to pick up maybe 30 or 40 percent of the uh, cortical white matter lesions that, were, that are not being seen now. And this shows just a, a basically a, a general idea of progression. Up here, here's an exacerbation, exacerbation, et cetera. And then uh, after a number of years, when one gets the, it, less of the exacerbations and more of the just sort of dwindles, the uh, progressive, slow progression of, uh, of increased symptoms. And this, this, is, this shows what an MRI looks like at each of these stages. And you can see, you know, a normal brain in the beginning, a little bit of atrophy here, and a significant amount of atrophy here in the later stages. Not that everyone goes through that. There, it, it's, that's a very uh, gross generalization. Or a lot of people who have MS for, for years and years, and that doesn't happen to them. Um, there's a thing called the McDonald criteria. And the McDonald criteria, you know, up, Prior to MRI, uh, the diagnosis of MS was based upon symptoms. You know, did symptoms come and go? Did somebody have symptoms in one neurological area and then they went away and then it would come in another neurological area, like they would have uh, blurry vision and then another time they'd have numbness on the leg, something like that. And that, that's the way that, that we would make the diagnosis. It was recurrence of, of symptoms over time in space. So with the advent of MRI, we found out that we could actually speed up the diagnosis of MS because we could document the progression of disease in time and in space and be able to make a diagnosis sooner. And so that's what the McDonald criteria were created for. It, it's a series, it's an algorithm where we can look at uh, different aspects of the MRI and make a determination early on, you know, whether or not this is really MS or not, instead of having to wait a year or two or three before another set of symptoms come. So this is a, a big advance for in terms of diagnosing MS. Uh, this is just a, uh, uh, an image of uh, the optic nerves, and this is using that technology called double inversion recovery. And you can see here we, a plaque is seen in the, uh, in the optic nerve on the right. In, in radiology, things are reversed. And so the right is left and left is right. So. Um, and, and, and this is the sort of thing you can pick up, which you can't pick up in standard, uh, standard sequences. Uh, this gives an idea of uh, the development of MS that, um, that uh, people have a normal MRI. This, I think the study was, if I remember correctly, it was like 14 years down the road, that the probability of having multiple sclerosis based upon initial MRI, that if, uh, you know, if the uh, MRI was normal from the beginning, 
risk was greatly different than if the MRI was abnormal at the beginning. And it's just a, another measure of, of how the MRI helps us in determining, you know, not only what the, you know, the diagnosis itself, but the severity of the diagnosis, which helps guide us, you know, how aggressive you want to be on your treatment. Uh, it's another similar, just a different way of looking at it, a number of uh, lesions on the MRI at the beginning and, uh, and then years later uh, based upon EDSS. And EDSS is a score of, of symptoms. So the higher your score, the more symptoms you have. Like this person would be basically, you know, non-ambulatory. This person would be using a, a walker. This person would be able to walk without, with minimal difficulty. And you can see that if uh, one, they had, uh, uh, you know, it makes quite a bit of difference if they had zero lesions at baseline, nobody progressed. They had one to three lesions, this would be the progression, you know, 31% uh, would progress a little bit, uh, but to an EDS uh, uh, S of 10, nobody would progress. But if you had, somebody had a lot of lesions, more than 10 lesions, then the probability of progressing to these stages was much higher. It's another way of understanding how MRI is useful in, in, di in, in, in diagnosing and managing and deciding on treatments for MS. Okay, medical therapy. Um, the, what they wanted me to, do, what Stu wanted me to talk about was, uh, was really symptomatic treatment. And symptomatic treatment can be as important or actually more important in some cases than, than actual medications for the prevention of MS. You know, that, uh, that the medications we have now available for, for treating the MS itself, um, for slowing down the disease progression, really only works in the, in the stages that's called relapsing remitting, when the symptoms come and then they go away and then a year or so later, maybe something else comes and goes away, that, that, that fluctuating course. Uh, you know, if the MS progresses to that, that steady, slow progression, which is called secondary progression, those medications don't do anything anymore. They, in the beginning, where there's still a little fluctuation, they have some effect, but, but later on, when there's really no more fluctuation, the medications don't, don't do anything to the disease because the disease is actually different than what it was in the beginning. The, the disease changes. And uh, we, we don't really have uh, any treatments for that right now, which is the bad news. But the good news is that we have so many new uh, medications coming on the market, they're, and there are going to be now so many choices uh, over the next few years that the uh, pharmaceutical companies are really not going to invest that much more money into developing new treatments for uh, the relapsing remitting. So now they're going to be you know, directing their resources more toward trying to, under, first of all, understand, you know, what happens in secondary progressive MS, and then once it's better understood, try to, try to interfere with it, try to develop a drug that would somehow affect that, that progression. So that's, that's the, uh, the good news. Uh, so in, in those people who are in secondary progressive, obviously symptomatic treatment is way more important. And so, you know, when it comes to symptomatic treatment, we had a you know, great talk earlier tonight about a neurogenic bladder. That's one of the, one of the, one of the biggest uh, issues, um, uh, you know, in, in, in MS. Those who develop the neurogenic bladder really has a major impact on their lifestyle. So to get that, those symptomatic treatments uh, correctly, um, you know, tuned up, tuned in for that, that patient, everybody's different, what works for them and, and what the proper thing to do is, that makes a huge difference in, uh, in um, in their quality of life. So the, another issue is spasticity. There are a number of uh, medications on the market that have been, you know, uh, designed for uh, relieving, uh, you know, the rigidity or the spasticity that occurs from in, in MS, and it can be used in other neurological disorders as well. And you know, I'm sure everybody's familiar with baclofen and tizanidine and some of the others. Uh, one less lesser known one is uh, fentanyl. It's a narcotic patch that actually works very well in some people. Um, I'm sure we could hear some testimonial about that. And then, of course, there's the, uh, the intrathecal pumps uh, that are, uh, can be very effective. You know, by, by taking the baclofen and infusing it directly into the spinal canal, that by, uh, you get more drug delivery to exactly where you need it, and thereby you have less side effects. So you can really crank it up and get more, uh, more re relaxation from the drug than you can by pill and at the same time avoid, you know, for those who have taken back a little, sometimes you, it can make you a little dizzy or feel a little drowsy or something like that. You can avoid that by doing the, uh, the direct infusion with a pump. So, and that's, that's, you know, that's the right thing for a few people. Um, also, a, a newer treatment on the market that, that really, you know, it, uh, it varies from person to person, but can be extremely uh, 
useful as Empira. And, uh, you know, those of you there, I'm sure there's some of you in the, in here tonight who have taken it and had a great result and others who've taken it and haven't noticed too much. But the, the thing is, it's a pretty benign drug and, and the, there's always, uh, you know, there's always a potential that somebody could really have a very good um, response to it. So it's something that, you know, definitely has to be tried on everybody. Um, you know, who has difficulty with walking. Obviously, you have to be able to walk some to get any benefit out of it. Um, and, but, the, you know, it's made the difference in, uh, you know, uh, one report we got was um, that would allow a woman to be able to walk from one side of her kitchen to the other, which for her was huge. It was huge. And uh, so it was, that's well worth, you know, uh, you know, the experiment, so to speak. So, you know, that, that's been a treatment that's really been, uh, had a, had made a good difference what we're doing. Fatigue, that's, that's, one of the, that's probably the number one reason why people can't work. It's not that they can't walk or they can't you know, have problems with vision or something like that. It's that they just have so much fatigue. And for those of you who uh, don't know about this, the, the fatigue is, you know, for a normal person, normal by this, don't have MS, they, uh, if you get the flu, you know how drained you get uh, with the flu. You just don't want to get out of bed. You don't have any energy. That's the same kind of fatigue that MS patients get, and some of them all the time. And so, it, you, could, so you know, they'll, they'll arrive at work, get out of the car, and walk across the parking lot. By the time they get to the office, they're done. You know, they just don't have any more energy to, uh, to keep going. So it's a, it's a huge issue to try and, 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 and treat this properly. And, you know, we do have some uh, effective treatments uh, on the market that, uh, uh, that are, are, can be very effective, and one just has to, in a, you know, an organized uh, way, you know, uh, try them out with each person and, and you know, uh, watch out for any side effects, watch out how it might affect the sleep, um, et cetera, how it might affect their mood. And there are a lot of things one has to watch, but in general, they're well tolerated and in general, they're very effective and can make a, uh, you know, big difference in quality of life. Uh, cognitive dysfunction, uh, you know, some, I, I think that there's no real direct treatment for that. The best thing is, is using the, you know, prevent as much as you can as early as you can. Um, I, if somebody has a lot of fatigue and you improve the fatigue, generally their cognitive function gets a little better as well, uh, objectively and subjectively. Um, and the, oh, this, I just happen to have a C CSVI slide in here. We don't know what's going to happen here. But uh, and it's, it looks like that it's not a cure-all, uh, but you guys know, know what I mean by CCSVI, right? The venous blockage from uh, the veins draining the, uh, the brain. And it turns out that the, uh, the vein strictures occur in other diseases as well. It's not just uh, 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 exclusive to MS. And so there, there, there's apparently there's some connection that's not well understood, uh, but as the, the cure, clearly not. Uh, is it beneficial in any way? Maybe. Uh, if, you, if, if anybody is going to get into this and, and do this CCSVI thing, I would just, you know, highly recommend just for the benefit of everyone who has MS to do it in the U.S. as part of a trial, you know, instead of going off to Bolivia or, you know, wherever and uh, having it done. To have it done here within a trial so that, that, you, that we can gather the data and, and use that to answer the question, you know, whether it really does anything or not. So um, that's it. Thank you.